do a little football for with Johnny Mac. What's going on, bud? Hey, how are you guys? Pete Thompson's there. Oh. Pretty excited about yeah. that. Well, we're doing this show from my house. If you weren't quarantined, you'd have to come. We're having beers on the porch. we got basketball going. I mean, this is a great time. Hey, well, you guys, is there social distancing going on? Because I can we, stay we, six uh, feet we have away take, if you need. We have a tape measure here. We are six feet away from each other, kind of. Pete Thompson, you are how far from me? Uh, five, uh, six feet exactly. Well, let's go. I mean, you use this side of your body for me, and then we're on the other side for him. Right. This is not fair. So, John, we were just having an interesting conversation. Well, we thought it was an interesting conversation. A lot of stuff about Ertz going around. You know, there was these wacky rumors that are just that, rumors. But the whole thing that he didn't uh, accept the deal, which we, we discussed the other day. Um, but if you were, to, we said, if you were to get the Diggs package for Ertz, would the Eagles consider that deal, or do they feel that Ertz is essential? You know, it's an interesting question, and a lot of it has to do with Dallas Goddard, obviously, and the fact that I, I kind of mentioned that yesterday on social media. The only reason you kind of give pause is because they have Dallas Goddard. Typically, when the Eagles identify someone and want to extend them, uh, they get it done, uh, but it's always in a team-friendly uh, contract. And Zach is smart enough to understand his value, uh, I think. Um, and, and that's the reason he, he didn't agree to an extension uh, when he could have agreed to an extension. So it's not necessarily that the team doesn't want him. In fact, it has nothing to do with that. And, and it has nothing to do with the fact that Zach um, doesn't want to play here. Um, so uh, I think much of it is overblown. It's just the natural give and take of negotiation. And you have a player kind of understands his worth. And if he waits uh, and bets on himself, he's going to get more money. Uh, but from the Eagles' perspective, you just brought up an instance. You always have to put that in the back of your mind. Well, if things continue uh, to, to drag on, you do have another really good tight end. So the second part is, if you would think about trading Zach Ertz, that means you have to get receivers. So if the Eagles ever get receivers and they can play 11 personnel, which is what Doug wants to do anyway, then, yeah, they might consider trading Zach Ertz uh, if things continue, uh, again, to drag. But they don't have any receivers. So at, at right now, that's not an option. That's interesting that you said that because Hunter and I just got into this drawn-out conversation about whether or not they want to play 12 personnel or do they play 12 personnel because that's the personnel that they've been dealt. Well, they drafted Dallas Goddard, to be fair. So it wasn't like they were dealt this card. They put themselves in that position to 12 personnel. Yeah, I mean, but they don't want to play 12. And, and, that's, and when I say they don't want to – play 12 they don't want to play as much 12 they play more 12 than anyone else in the nfl and you can look at the efficacy of when they do it's not good compared to teams that that are high octane and play 11 so the ultimate goal is to have three really good wide receivers to be able to play the majority of the time at 11 personnel but have two really good tight ends so when you are in 12, you're that much more effective. The goal, and, and Doug Peterson's default, and to be honest, most, not all, but most coaches in this league in the modern era is to get as many receivers on the field as possible because you're more explosive. So if the Eagles had good receivers, they would be playing more 11 personnel, and that's what Doug would prefer. They just don't have good receivers, so – they they default to their good their next best players and they're better with the two tight ends on the field than three bad receivers. So that's why they play as much twelve as they do. Well, sticking with Dak Ertz, he's twenty nine years old right now. If they were to extend him, what do you think a reasonable number would be per year to keep him here? I mean, he is getting to that probably last contract, big contract of, of his career. So what do you think the numbers would look like? 
Well, uh, the numbers you just saw uh, Austin Hooper sign in in Cleveland, uh, it would be uh, north of those numbers. Um, When you have other guys, Kelsey and Kittle, uh, most notably, uh, those are the two that can argue are are better than Zach Ertz, and and they'd probably be correct. Um, So it's, you know, anytime you talk about contracts in the NFL, and I say this all the time, and a lot of people don't understand, it's not about the best player. It's about the timing. It's about when you're up. Uh, And if you're a good player at your position, you're – you set the bar. That's how it works. The next guy gets the most money. So ultimately, when he signs this deal, he will expect to be the highest paid tight end in the NFL. That's what he would be shooting for. And a best example of this is at the quarterback position, which moves so fluently. You don't have to go very far back to remember that Derek Carr was the highest paid player in the history of football. Jimmy Garoppolo, was the highest paid player in the history of football. Kirk Cousins was the highest paid player in the history of football. <clears throat> the bar keeps getting set as as quarterbacks go, and, and Dak Prescott will likely be next if the Cowboys uh, agree to a long-term deal. Everybody knows none of those guys are the best quarterback, but that's what contracts are about. It's timing and, and circumstance. Right. So what do you think the next move is for Howie Roseman? Well, we're, we're heading into the second wave of free agency now. So now it's about value. Now it's about bargains. Now it's about getting guys who uh, maybe uh, didn't get the market that they were expecting and will come down and play for one-year prove-it deal, deals. Robbie Anderson is a guy that – this team has tried to trade for two consecutive years. Fan base thinks he's really good. They're probably wrong, but that's another conversation. But he was expecting to get $12 million a year in free agency. Well, he's not getting $12 million. So the question is, how far down does it come? And if it gets to $7 million, $8 million, then something, something like that the Eagles might get involved in. But you can see that at every position. They need they need a lot. They need they still need another corner. They still need another safety. You could argue they need multiple uh, bodies at linebacker. They need probably an edge rusher. They need a swing tackle. They need an interior backup on the offensive line. They need a backup quarterback. They need, as I always say, 75 receivers. They need another running back to replace Jordan Howard. Still a lot of moves to be made, and a lot of them will come in the draft as well. Um, but there's a lot of bargain uh, bargains the Eagles will be searching for in that second wave of free agents. John McMullen, Football at 4, 97.3 ESPN.com, and, of course, uh, at J.F. McMullen. You know, the one thing, too <laughs> – if they come back, they're going to come back on it. I mean, that's almost 95% that Ertz is going to be here. And I'm, to be clear to the listeners, there's nobody here that wants Ertz gone. It was just more hypothetical stuff that comes up this time of the year, especially when you're quarantined for, uh, you know, days at a time. Things start to enter your mind. That being said, you mentioned he doesn't want to play 12 personnel. With Gert, Ertz and Goddard back again, and even if they end up getting a couple of, you know, receivers in the draft and all that kind of stuff, is 12 personnel the way they're going to have to go back if those two guys are back? Well, again, when I say they don't want to play 12 personnel, what I mean is they don't want to play as much 12 personnel. And that right. will rely drastically on what receivers they get. If they get a receiver in the first round, for instance, uh, and he's effective from day one, which, by the way, is – the rumors going around this league is that there's not going to be an off season. There's not going to be any off season work. So rookies are going to show up in August, hopefully, uh, and they're not going to have that time to ramp up. Uh, but it, it, in best case scenario, if, if a first round pick hits the ground running, if you sign a, a Robbie Anderson, Brashad Perriman, if Deshaun Jackson is healthy and the third receiver, 
then, yeah, they're going to play more 11 uh, and less 12. Uh, but it all depends on how effective the wide receivers are. If you're John, how much of this Greg depends Warden, on how much I was just going to how much of this depends on Deshaun Jackson? Like well, what their offense, lot. what I, their offense looks like, what their offense looks like next year depends on how much trust that they want to build an offense around Deshaun Jackson's speed. Yeah, I, I, I don't think they're going to go into it with that sentiment and that we can build around Deshaun Jackson. I think they're realistic about that. Um, you just can't count on him at this stage. You can't count on him to be healthy. Um, uh, 33 years old as a receiver, I, I mean, you, you hope in that situation. And if it works out, great. Uh, but you can't plan and, and say this is our cornerstone. Um, so the Eagles are, are cognizant of that. Um, and that's why I say if, if a bunch of things happen um, and the receivers play at a high level, uh, and, and then you're, you're where you want to be. If you have another season where Greg Ward is playing a lot and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside is struggling and Deshaun Jackson's in and out of the lineup. Well, they're going to play the most 12 in the NFL again. But that's not mm -hmm. what they want to do. All right, uh, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. Let's look at, um, you know, the week that kind of was here real quick and kind of go back and, you know, uh, because I thought Hargrave got swept under the rug a lot. And I know we touched on him a little bit, but I really feel how, how do you see – them using him is this with Fletcher to give Fletcher a break um you know is Malik Jackson going to kind of be that third guy how do you view the three guys that they currently have because I think John if a team said hey our two interior um tackles are Malik Jackson and uh, Javon Hargrave you got a pretty good interior defense there and they're part of a three-person thing so how do you see him adding to the defensive tackle spot, which was a mess last year. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be the starter next to Fletcher Cox, and it's interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, you, you just talked about all of us in self-quarantine in the offseason and things go through your mind, and, and you think about this. The Eagles have talked about for years, really, uh, especially coming off Chip Kelly and and – you know, how many how many snaps the defense would play just because of the way he went about it and, and how, how they would get worn down. Uh, so you look at a player like Fletcher Cox, he's been an all-pro in the past, and, and they've been talking for years about you got to sort of cut down his workload uh, to expand, uh, extend his prime as much as possible. And that's like something you say – in March, <laughs> we're sitting here uh, in late March now, and you say, yeah, on paper, that sounds great. But then you get to a game and you say, hey, these are NFL games. And how many come down to the fourth quarter? How many are one-score games? And, you know, it's tough to be disciplined and take Fletcher Cox off the field and say, I want to rotate. I want to save them. And that's what happens every year. The Eagles go, well, no, we need Fletcher on the field to win these games. Now, the theory is, as you mentioned, you have Hargrave and Jackson now. So you have two high-level defensive tackles, although you have to kind of wait and see how healthy is Malik. And then the conversation becomes, if you're not giving le legitimate reps, uh, how, how, I mean, Malik is an eight-figure player. Hargrave's an eight-figure player. You're talking about situational guys playing 25 snaps, making right. 10 million a year. That's that's tough to do. So mm -hmm. I, I I still think we have to see how that shakes out. And some have speculated we'll kick Malik Jackson outside. I can tell he has told me flat out to my face he does not like to play defensive end. Did he give a reason? It, yeah, he doesn't like it. I, I mean, he's not comfortable <laughs> doing it. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. But and then let's say, but let's say, you know, Jim Schwartz is a is a hard nosed guy. It's not like somebody will say, "Oh, I don't want to do this." If he thinks that's 
the best way to win, he's going to do it. But then you're taking Brandon Graham off the field or Derek Barnett. Now, obviously, you're not taking Brandon off the field. So that means you're taking Derek Barnett off the field, which people can say fine, but that's a former first-round pick. He he may have not lived up to the expectations of some people to this point, but I got to tell you, he's a heck of a lot better edge rusher than Malik Jackson, who who doesn't do it and doesn't like doing it. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I don't know how that's going to work out, and I don't think necessarily it's going to work out in a good way. But what I can tell you is. Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave are going to be the starting defensive tackles, and those two guys are going to play well. Uh, Very interesting conversation right there with John. Good stuff, Johnny Mac. Uh, Let's go to the corners, which we touched on, obviously, with Slay. We all like that deal. Um, The other side, you mentioned it yesterday, Sidney Jones and Rasul Douglas will probably be uh, battling it out there, but they'll probably bring another guy in to compete with them. What? How do you see Jalen Mills' role now? Is he in the corner? Is he playing safety exclusively? Do they, you know, I've kind of mentioned that, hey, maybe Jim Schwartz looks at him as his new Malcolm Jenkins. How are you viewing the new Jalen Mills? Well, I think he's going to get an opportunity to play safety. I don't think it's much more than that. I I mean, if you look at his contract, the Eagles essentially gave him one one year and and guaranteed him $2 million. I I mean, that tells you all you need to know. Uh, There's no question Jim likes him, Jim trusts him, uh, Jim values him more than just about anybody else in this league. Uh, But the Eagles have acknowledged He's speed deficient on the outside. They realize that. Uh, So they made the move uh, inside. They are trying to, in some ways, copy what happened with Malcolm earlier in in his career uh, because he was drafted as a corner, moved to safety, uh, and obviously took off and excelled for a very long time. I think if people think that's automatically going to happen, I, I don't, I wouldn't count on that. Um, but he'll be given an opportunity. But that's another position. I, I don't think the Eagles are saying, okay, we're going to pencil in uh, Jalen Mills as our start, starting strong safety to replace Malcolm Jenkins. He'll compete for that job, but they're going to bring in someone else at some point, whether it's uh, as well, you, a free agent you, or, or somebody in the draft. Do you see a scenario then where Mills doesn't have a role? That's where I'm having a hard time with him just being uh, the deal. The one year five million is kind of interesting, and that he's gonna you know hey get a chance to play safety. But if they bring in someone else in and beat him out, I I, I find it hard that he, that Schwartz is gonna leave is gonna be left with him having no role. Yeah, I find that hard to believe as well because he likes him. But he could be—he could easily move to being a backup corner again. He can do a lot of different things. Uh, he does have versatility. He can play inside. He can play outside at the corner position. Now the Eagles have earmarked him as a safety. Uh, so he might be that Swiss utility knife uh, if they bring in a, a more high-profile safety next to Rodney McLeod. Uh, you know, you've seen – over the years, especially over the past couple of years, hey, you need bodies in the defensive backfield because guys go down at an alarming rate. And it, you look at the other corner spot opposite Darius Slay, look, you can't count on Rasul Douglas to play at a high level. You can't count on Sidney Jones to play at a high level. So, I, I mean, again, we talk about – I, I just talked about it with Fletcher and, and Javon and, and Malik Jackson. You, you can pencil things in, and I'll bring up Chip Kelly again. You pencil it in, <laughs> you write it in the beach, you write it in sand uh, at this time of year. I mean, who's to say they get a better safety and all of a sudden you could say, hey, Jalen is better than Rasul Sidney. We're not able to get another corner. Let's move them over there. That could happen. Yeah. Just because you say you want to move someone to safety in March doesn't mean 
you're you're locked in. You're not saying this stuff under oath. You can change your mind at any point. <laughs> Um, Mills did play safety in college for his, uh, you know, couple couple years, not his entire college career. Um, do you think that Mills would actually be a better NFL safety than he was a uh, corner? Which he was not a bad corner. Let's not say that this guy was terrible. It just, you know, he was a, a good, not great uh, corner. But do you think that his skill set would lend him to be a better safety? Uh, well, I will say this. Uh, a lot of people have thought uh, that he would project better than sa- at safety because of the lack of speed. Generally, that's what happens. If you're not really fast, and people have said it about Rasul Douglas as well for years, uh, that he would be better at safety. Uh, I can say up until this point, uh, the Eagles have not considered it, uh, moving Jalen Mills to safety. The question has been asked. The question has been asked to Jim Schwartz on multiple occasions. The question has been asked to Jalen himself. Before this move in the offseason, before this re-signing, Jalen was on record saying, no, I'm not moving to safety. Jim was on record. No, I'm not moving him to safety. So clearly something shifted in the Eagles' thinking. And I think all of these dominoes come from the Malcolm Jenkins decision. Because I, th- I and I and I said this. I think if Malcolm is here, I think Rodney isn't, <laughs> um, and I think Jalen's probably still a corner. Uh, clearly, Jalen Mills didn't get the market that he expected in unrestricted free agency. The Eagles couldn't work things out with Malcolm, so they said, "You know what? You're a, a burgeoning leader. Uh, let's see if we can make things work with you." You're a little speed deficient, as I said. Let's try to move you back to safety, and we'll see what happens. And then from Rodney McLeod's standpoint, uh, they needed that continuity, and he's expected to be the new leader in the secondary. He's expected to take over Malcolm's role, be the guy who's the voice and get everybody lined up correctly. Uh, John McMullen, Football at Four. We do it every day at this time on the Sports Bash at J.F. McMullen uh, for the NFL. And, of course, uh, the NFL All-Season Phase 2 will be uh, continuing. We'll be all over it next week here on the Sports Bash. Thanks, pal. Hey, thank you, guys. Appreciate it.